morning, everyone. Welcome to the ladies class this morning. It's good to see everyone today. Um, I have a note from Lori Lum here who was supposed to teach today and um, she's asked me to cover for her. Marsha McDonald is on 24 hour hospice care for cancer. Um, we've had several of our church ladies help with her. Bobby Ponder, which I really miss Bobby Ponder. Chris Williams, Becky Kretzinger, so thankful for them and Marcia's artist friends. Um, Kate Measures and Jean St. Clair were also her friends who were noted for inviting her to South Maine many years ago. What a blessing. I just noticed, uh, my mom told me last night, she said, on, on your church it says established in 1856. And I said, does it really? She was like, that was before the Civil War, Kayla, and she was like, people have been meeting at that building since before the Civil War, and I thought, well, I've never noticed the big sign on the front door, but I just thought that was so cool, and I said, thank you for telling me that. That's really powerful, and um, this place is a sacred place, and just to think about, in the case of Marsha McDonald, you know, people you invite somebody to church and you just you just never never really know all the fruits of your labor some we see some we don't see I do apologize um, for the appearance today I try to normally be uh, more presentable as a sign of respect but today I'm in a fishing cap that I stole from my husband years ago so I don't mean any disrespect by that but it was very last minute so here we go. We are going through lesson five, talking about greed and generosity in the gates of Jerusalem. Lori did a great job last time, weeks ago, when she spoke about it. Um, it has been so many weeks, and we're only going over two days today. I wanted to go ahead and start back on page 117 with the original lesson and kind of just barely refresh those first three days and then get back into the last two days. And all um, comments are very much welcome and appreciated <laughs> today. So um, let's go ahead and say a quick prayer, please. Dear Lord, our gracious and heavenly Father, Thank you for today. Thank you that it's a beautiful day in a beautiful nation, in a truly beautiful world. And Lord, we grieve over all the things that Satan has done and is doing um, to the beauty of all things that you've created. But we do see you triumph and we do see you continue to be sovereign and continue to lead and when we quit looking at the things around us and the things of the enemy and instead focus on you and your power and your glory you always were you are you always will be you have already won the war when Jesus died for our sins on the cross we cannot thank you enough for that Help us to be your hands and feet and servants in your kingdom as we, um, as we go about this time between Jesus the Messiah coming and um, the end days. Help us to be strong. Help us to be faithful. Please um, let your spirit be here with us today. Give us um, thoughts and give us words and guidance in your spirit to have a fruitful morning this morning. We thank you so much for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot on um, about fearing God lately, and Lori touched on that. Um, she did a, a great job covering that, actually, several weeks ago. So I, I wanted to open up with a story about, I was at Target the other day, and um, I was holding a child and I was like pushing the other cart back into where the carts go and um, 
she was an older woman and she said, you're doing a great job. And I thought, hmm, I feel like I'm kind of just getting along, you know, but I do, I do love my kids and I'm caring for them. And so I said, have you ever, did you have children of your own? And she said, no, I never did. But um, they are a, they're a blessing to you. And I was holding Cass and she said, you never know who you're raising. He could be a doctor, he could be a lawyer, he could be a preacher. And hopefully one of these days he comes to visit you with those pretty blue eyes and that blonde hair. And she said, but you need to teach these children to fear God. And I said, you're absolutely right. And she said, these are not your children. They're the Lord's children. They're not yours to spoil. They're yours to raise, to fear God. And I was like, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. And I've, I've really been into the Old Testament a lot this year. And she said, well, so have I. And um, I was like, I, I really... I really appreciate what you have to say. We talked a little bit, and then some other friend that I know came by. This is the Target uh, parking lot, after all. So moms are always, always at Target. And um, so I said goodbye to him, and she respectfully stepped out of the way and went on to the store, and I just saw it. You know, that verse about how there are angels among us? You know, and I, there was a part of me that was like, no. Don't go. Don't go. Come back. Let's have some coffee. Stay all day. And it really taught me a lesson. Um, I struggle with courage to tell people about the Lord and Jesus Christ. And do they want to hear? Um, how will they receive that message? And there are so many people just waiting for it. You know, just desperate for it. Longing for it. They want to hear. They're either in agreement and it's confirmation or they're seeking something and we have it so it just taught me to step out in boldness and again she wasn't telling me the lord loves me no matter what she was telling me to raise my children right to fear god to teach them to fear god and i loved it so um just wanted to start out with that story about um fearing god which um i'm learning leads to obedience he, um, you see some wrath in the Old Testament, and I think um, he's still a God that um, punishes or allows, you know, um, allows us to have the consequences of our own actions. And um, for that, I'm grateful. Where would my kids be if I never allowed the consequences of their own actions? If I just let them kind of wander off in the way they thought they should go and they thought was fun, you know, that's it's not a good parent. And he is a wonderful parent, wonderful enough to always be working on turning us back when we go astray. Um, so on page 117, the last couple sentences I liked, Nehemiah tirelessly worked to do right by his people, while the Jewish leaders and merchants simultaneously took advantage of them. Years of moral decline manifested in the physical deterioration in Jerusalem. Nehemiah could rebuild the walls, but the attitudes and selfishness within the walls required a more subtle kind of repair. And I just wonder, has this happened to our nation? Has this happened to me or you personally? And it's time to dig our way out. And then on page 119, let's see. We found that regardless of the weaponry, be it fear, ridicule, disappointment, or physical attack, the counterattack begins with turning to the Lord. The enemy looms large in our minds until we set our eyes on God. One time my mother gave me this sign from Hobby Lobby, I'm sure, but it said, don't tell the storm, don't tell God how big the storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that. So let's, um, I just, I want to go ahead and read the scripture, like I said, since it has been several weeks. So we'll go ahead and read Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. 
And there was a great... What? Go ahead. I was going to read it with you. Okay. You read it. Well, like... Uh, was it Lauren that was having us all read together or somebody? Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Why you read Jordan? Yes. Well, let's do it. Let's read together. And there was great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. On page 121, there's a point um, along the side, and it says, As we see in Scripture, God often used a famine to achieve his will and complete his plan. God does nothing without cause. He used famine for his work and his glory. Moreover, he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed the provisions of bread. So it's always neat to see um, even the hard times, God is in control and God has purpose behind it and he will use it for his good. Um, there's a verse and a song on the radio about how um, God, you use what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. And that's very true. And that gives a lot of hope. Now let's turn to page 124 and read Nehemiah 5. Verse 4 through 6. Kathy, would you please read that for us? There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. And indeed, we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. It's interesting to see someone in the Bible get angry mm -hmm. and then also see how they handle it. Because there are times that we will become angry, um, especially with righteous anger. And that seems to be okay, but it's about how we handle it. Point number four on the side of page 125 it says debts canceled. The practice of selling family members into slavery was not uncommon in Old Testament times. However, the Mosaic law provided for the Jewish slaves to be set free and their debt canceled every seventh year or in the 50th year of Jubilee. The wealthy Israelites disregarded these laws and took advantage of their compatriots. Um, and I just thought, you know, Obviously, God is the one who cancels our debt. Our sin causes debt. We, we just can't um, hit the mark on our own. But because of Jesus, we do. And so he cancels our debts. And we need to let others' debts be canceled as well. We need to forgive others as Christ forgave us. Um, even if we have to lay it down over and over. I don't know about you, but sometimes when you're trying to forgive somebody or, or any other number of sins, um, I, thought I, I thought I got past it. I really had this moment and I really thought I had forgiven them fully. And maybe in that moment I did, but then um, you see someone years later and you just have this feeling toward them. Well, go forgive them again. I think sometimes you have to forgive people in your heart repeatedly. Um, when it's really eating at you, lay it down every single day, maybe multiple times a day if you have to. But then even if you feel something about, about it years later, just go back and start laying it down some more um, at Jesus' feet, asking him to help you with it until you get there.
Moving on to day three, page 129. We'll read Nehemiah 5, verse 7 through 11. Barbara, would you read that, please? Yes. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly to, against them, and I said to them, according to our ability, we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nation? Our enemies are also with my brethren and my servants and lending them money and grain. Please, let us stop this usury. Restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also a hundred of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you have charged them. Hmm. Thank you. You know, sometimes I, in reading this, I, I just thought this group of people that had come back to restore the walls and all was a much smaller group of people. But this was a large group of people. Large enough that they conducted business and, <coughs> and had shops and things. And, and this brings it more to like a, a big deal. Big deal. What weren't many of them coming from the outer towns? Yeah. It's not right. coming in. Yeah. And to mm -hmm. help. It wasn't mm -hmm. just <laughs> well, it was not just a small group of people that were doing this. I mean, this was a big, a big um, nationwide thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. So it's so comparable to what is going on. You know? mm -hmm. It really mm -hmm. is. Okay. Put the mask back on. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Let's see. I think the last point on this one, and then we'll move to this week, um, the two days we were supposed to be studying, is number, actually the living out number six on page 130. Next, Nehemiah appealed to their sense of morality by reminding them what they were doing was not good. Rather than continuing in the behavior that would bring reproach in the eyes of their enemies, Nehemiah urged them to walk in the fear of our God. So whenever we sin, whenever God's people sin, we, we dishonor his name, we bring shame, upon his name by his people acting this way and we really need to uh, repent and turn i was pretty pleasantly surprised by the example of the folks here they repented and they turned right away mm -hmm. if only it were always so easy to where the wiser person would um, would bring out our sins and ask us to repent and we said okay and we'll start doing all these things and we will turn and we will do our best to get better right away. Kayla, I thought that was pretty even neat. Even David didn't realize how deep in sin that he was until it was pointed out mm -hmm. to him. And uh, then he said, oh, yeah, that's me. Right. And so, and he turned from that right away, you know, and repented and was deeply sorrowful. Mm -hmm. But... As you said, and I thought the same thing at the same time, if only we, not only as Christians but as a nation, could um, come to terms with the things that are being done that are wrong and want and have the desire to turn from them and back to go more godly ways. Right. We could be, uh, there's so many wonderful, positive 
beautiful things that could come from that. Mm -hmm. We could be a nation under God again. Absolutely. When I think about these people that have repented, it wasn't just a small thing. If you took over somebody's property, then you moved your daughter and her family into their home, and you started farming that, and you've built your life around that income. So to repent of that is a big deal. Like, it overturns other lives. It's kind of like a, it's not just mm -hmm. a little like, okay, here's mm -hmm. your deed. You can have your property back. You know how we think that everything's ours yeah. when it's not? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, it's interesting to see people repent from that just like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think we don't <clears throat> give enough <clears throat> understanding of what repentance means mm -hmm. like you were saying true repentance hurts that's why it works you don't want to go through it again it just it hurts mm -hmm. I agree um, I've been trying to jump ahead a little bit into <clears throat> my um, topic of, of confession that I get to cover later but um, I listened to, to a preacher saying how confession is just one thing. It's just the first step. And it's very good and it's very helpful. But confession without repentance mm -hmm. just isn't, yeah, that's just not the key. That's not it. You're missing the big piece. If you're confessing your sin, but you're not repenting of that sin. So he said that to repent means to turn away from to stop doing it and um, if then there was also someone saying there should be fruits of repentance and I'd always thought about fruits of good labor but he's saying there should be fruits of repentance if you're truly repenting from something that should be evident in your life and in your lifestyle and I don't know about you but if you've ever really tried to repent from a sin that's really entangled you and gotten in for a while and it's it's a part of your life a part of your thinking your attitude um, where you go what you do you have to make huge changes you know you may have to change um, you know where you go who you hang out with um, you might have to change daily routines you know I need to stop this habit so I have to replace it with a positive habit and repentance is supposed to have a lot of action behind it a lot of hard work it's it's hard work I mean, these people gave gave the money back I mean we would have spent it and then put a little bit more on the credit card you know assuming more to come in but they they found a way to give it back and do all these other things and there was a lot of action behind their words it was certainly not just words these people really meant it and they were truly repenting well nehemiah not only pointed out their sins but he gave the great example of how to help and care for people how to give of yourself and your monies so that you could care for those that were struggling mm -hmm. so he uh, accomplished a couple of different things I think with the people right he was he's a great example in what he did and they're a really good example in what they did in response um, and then I just had a note here about fearing God um, Enemies know that division and self-destruction brings weakness in our nation, in our home, in our church. Mm -hmm. Division is very destructive. Um, like I said, brings weakness. And so it's certainly something of um, the devil. So we, we don't want to cater to that at all. There will be consequences. When we truly fear God and consider his righteousness, all-knowingness, holiness, and wrath, we obey him. So it helps to get to know God more. That helps us to trust God more when we really get to know him and his nature. And it also helps us to obey.
obey him more because there there is some healthy fear there um, absolutely when we truly get to know God through his word um, which displays his character and history and through prayer and through the spirit and um, and his church Lori told us about the seven benefits of those who fear the Lord, and I really appreciated that list um, as she focused on fearing the Lord. Number one, there's deep spiritual knowledge, Proverbs 1-7. Number two, there's divine wisdom, Psalms 111, verse 10. Number three, there's a unique weapon against sin in Exodus 20-20. Number four, the, um, the mercy of God is talked about in Luke 1, 50. Number five is life, Proverbs 10, 27. Number six, protection for you and your children, Proverbs 14, 26. Number seven is friendship with God, Psalms 25, 14. You know, this fits so well with your target encounter with the lady of telling you to teach your children to fear God. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that is so important because you don't want them to be afraid of God, not that kind of fear. What an awesome to be in awe of God. And I think as mothers, you know, a lot of us have already had our kids, but you are still in that, that stage of rearing the kids. But it's important, I think, that every aspect that you do with them, you somehow bring in God. That what you're doing is something that God likes. Um, the beauty of this earth is because of God. Uh, the little things, the flowers, the little petals. You have children and teaching them that God made those. You're starting their minds to think, hey, this guy, this God is some something else, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to think every activity that we do, you bring God into it. And that's, I think, how we build fear of God in our the awesomeness of God in our children's lives. Mm -hmm. And you're not raising young children anymore, but <coughs> like that woman that encountered me at Target, she kind of raised me a little bit yeah. on that day, yeah. you know, and she taught me. So if we, if we continue to do these things, and the verse you pointed out a couple of years back in a Bible study that really stuck with me about how we when we walk with our children and talk mm -hmm. with our children mm -hmm. and lay, lay down to sleep, mm -hmm. lay them down to sleep, you know, we should always be talking about them. And if, if you just continue to do that, even with some random person at Target, and you just say, oh, you know, talk about the Lord's beauty and then just walk on, you never know what that will do for someone. Even though we don't have small children, you have married kids, hey, You've got grandchildren, or you've got married kids. You've got grown kids that still may need to learn the fear of God. Mm -hmm. And by, the, by their actions and their deeds, and I would say so, you don't ever, you don't ever quit right. teaching your kids the fear of God. Mm -hmm. yes. That's one of the beauties of teaching at a Christian call, a school, is mm -hmm. that you can continue to walk with the parent and partners in teaching those children mm -hmm. the, the fear and the love of God. And how he offers those choices and consequences. <coughs> that, that was always my first lesson in the first day of school, first grade, was Good move and consequences mm -hmm. and the life skill. And it wasn't that I was giving them punishment. I gave them choices. And then they chose to do right or to do wrong. And when they did wrong, then there was another choice of consequences. You know, mm -hmm. They had to give something up or, um, you know, they did, I right. had several. And I just think that that's what, 
One of the things we see wrong with our society in general, that we have forgotten that every choice we make has a consequence. Mm -hmm. And the choice that lady made to witness to you that day had a blessing for her and for you. Mm -hmm. That's a very smart move with the teaching on the first day of school, but we'll just go ahead and get that out there. There will be consequences in this class because how else are you supposed to have a healthy environment? Well, and other, if you don't have that, then it's always the teacher's fault that the negative is transpiring. Mm -hmm. And this one, the child, and sometimes if it got, you know, there was a ladder to which you, and one of them was to write a note to the parent. <laughs> to tell them what they had done and how they were going to correct it, you know. Mm -hmm. But our society in general has forgotten that for every choice there is a consequence. Right. And God offers us those choices. And mm -hmm. He fortunately teaches us through the consequences that, you know, the illness, the, uh, just uh, the problems, the struggles that we go through. Those are growth spurts for us, too. Mm -hmm. I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Building on what Barbara was saying, the, you, you talk about what interests you. There are some people that you know when they walk in the room, they're going to be talking about sports. Mm -hmm. You know that that's that's what's near their heart, and so it's a it's from an internal thing that that's going on that you that it outpours to your children and to to others mm -hmm. around you. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, we have it's because I haven't seen him in forever. A friend who it didn't matter what other people were talking about. Within 15 minutes of entering the room and the conversation, he had maneuvered mm -hmm. the conversation to talk about God. Because mm -hmm. that was that was where he what he was interested in. He wasn't interested in your sports or, you know, politics. He had, he would maneuver the conversation to talk about what he wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so it just outpoured right. from something going on inside. Mm -hmm. Right. And the Bible does say that, that out from your heart, you know, what comes from your lips is an outpouring of your heart. And isn't it cool to hang out with Christians? Who will talk to you about the things that you want to talk about and if, if they're non-christians you know you may try to talk about it might get kind of a blank stare or something but then you're like man i can't wait to get back to church and say something to somebody and they're like yeah the lord's been putting that on my heart too and here's what's happening to me and have you read this scripture lately and it's very exciting so day four, we'll move into now page 133 at the bottom. Yesterday, we read about a different side of Nehemiah's character and personality. He was capable of righteous anger, but he also dealt with his anger in a productive rather than damaging way. He focused on his mission, and he was in control of himself. He determined the most effective way of dealing with the many individuals who needed to be confronted and compelled to proceed as God's people. And that's a personal challenge of mine. I do not like conflict, so mm -hmm. I would rather just avoid it. And um, this is a biblical example of when conflict needed to happen and how you can do that. I'll read Nehemiah 5, 12 through 13. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. 
Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to his promise. How cool is it to be called out for something and to repent and to say, yes, I'll give back the money, I'll give back the time, I'll give up the friends, and, and to just start praising God about it all. Because it's really not a loss. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, we know from previous chapters that Nehemiah prayed constantly for wisdom and how to handle things. And because he was a godly man and because God was giving him that wisdom, he, instead of just talking about what was going on with the people, he actually drew everybody together and presented the problem to everyone at once so that there could be no uh, misunderstanding about what the problem was. Mm -hmm. And in confronting the people, they had to face it, uh, which showed a lot of wisdom on his part. Mm -hmm. And God really drew him to accomplish that. Right. There's a time to build up and a time to tear down. I've thought about that lately, too. You know, um, so many people just need to be encouraged right now. They're down in the dumps, you know. But at the same time, if they've been sinning a lot because of, you know, how they're they're handling all this, all this madness around them, they need to be more than encouraged sometimes. Um, in a godly way, they need to be, um, there's a time to, to talk to people about how they're living. I would want that done for me. Let's see, so question number one on that same page. What three things did the people promise as a result of Nehemiah's assembly? They promised to restore the interest money, the land and possessions, um, require nothing from the poor, and they promised to be obedient when they said, we will do as you say. On page 135, there's a, a shaken robe in the margin and it points out that Nehemiah shook a garment to show that God would shake out or punish anyone who promised to do the right thing but went back on his word. Paul used a similar demonstration in Acts 18.6. And Jesus spoke of shaking the dust from your feet in Matthew 10.14. I liked how... Um, in Matthew, when Jesus spoke about that, and then how Paul would do that in, in Acts, Paul always took it so personally. The souls of everyone around him, he took it very personally. Um, but he did it in a healthy way. He saw that his job was to minister and testify to those people. And then if they wanted to repent and turn and follow God, he, he continued to be with them or, or made sure that someone continued to be with them. And if they rejected it, then he, he shook his robe and he said, in one verse he said, you know, well this will not be on my conscience because the Lord knows I did what I was supposed to do. And again, it's back to choices. And some people choose not to listen, not to obey. And hopefully at some point later on, God's gracious enough to give them um, another chance or two or three or four. And they do come to him because that is God's will. You know, at the bottom of page 133, it talks about him having righteous anger, mm -hmm. but he handled it in a productive way. And one of the things he did was he brought all the people together. 
you didn't just start with little small groups and talk with them and talk with them and talk with them. He got those that were involved with it and brought them together so that he could speak to all of them. <clears throat> this, to me, uh, saves so much time at a critical time when you're dealing with with hurt feelings and, and people who are not doing what's right. Get everybody that's involved together, if possible, and, and that's one thing he did. You see his track, you see his plan, uh, Nehemiah. I'm sure he prayed about this, because he's such a praying man, but he got them all together to expose what they had done. Maybe they never really thought of it that way, but whatever, mm -hmm. that's one of his approaches. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I like where it says he focused on his mission mm -hmm. and he was in control of himself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like this was a personal issue with him. Mm -hmm. This was everybody's problem and mm -hmm. he stayed in control. He did not show mm -hmm. his anger. Mm -hmm. And then the people praise the Lord mm -hmm. for it in the end. You know, we're, we're so worried to tell any group of people in a nice godly way that they should be doing things a little bit differently um, for fear of their response. But their response was um, to listen to him and do the right thing and then go, go on praising God for it. I think it also shows that any of us can get off track sometimes. We are... We're Christians and we're good people and we love love the Lord, but sometimes we can get off track. And for someone to love us enough to help us get back on track, mm -hmm. that's where mm -hmm. that's where you can really feel loved. It's because right. somebody looks at you and says, "Hey, um, there's a problem here, and I love you enough to want to help you. I don't want to see you go down this road." Right. And that's what he was basically saying. He, you know, he loved all the people. Mm -hmm. Just some of them had gotten off track. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been so willing to recognize their faults and get back on. Mm -hmm. They would have just ignored him and done what they wanted to. Right. <clears throat> they were probably miserable. You yeah. know, if you're living in sin and not obeying God's commandments, you might have some money or, or whatever the case may be, but they were probably miserable and kind of wanted a way out, but maybe nobody around them really seemed to want to want to change, and then somebody held them accountable. And apparently they all kind of wanted to change and were happy about it, but they kind of had influenced each other down this, down this road. I used to say to my students, I love you too much to let you ask this way. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. Jonathan was going to and that's true love, that sacrificial love, getting out of our own comfort zone when the Lord's really put something on our spirit or on our heart. The live out question number nine on page 135 says, the importance we place on keeping our word is a reflection of our integrity. Look up the following scriptures and note what each says about the role of integrity in our lives. Ask God to show you where you are not walking in integrity. And part of this, based on this scripture, it seems like um, integrity was to do what you say you're going to do when you do repent. Don't just um, make these promises and then get started and then quickly forget about it and just backslide right into your old ways. Integrity has to do with continuing out um, that repentance um, and not turning back. <clears throat> so I just, uh, I wrote down little brief summaries here by the scriptures. So it's always a blessing to just read scripture. So Psalm 7, 8 I was talking about a measure of which the Lord can judge by is your integrity. Psalm 25, 20 through 21. Integrity will protect you and guard your life. Proverbs 11, 3. Integrity guides you and delivers you from death. 
Proverbs 12, 22. It delights the Lord when we have integrity. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I think that's why God does have to punish us at times or just let the consequences of our sins play out because he is a just God. Um, he, he can't do anything other than that, and that is justice, you know. <laughs> actions do have consequences um, things need to be paid in that manner but at the same time praise God it's justice and mercy hand in hand otherwise the consequences of, of our sins would be would be too much to handle but because of his mercy they're not Day five, let's go to page 139, and I'll read Nehemiah 5, 14 through 19. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from the bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over them, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work, and at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was an one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowl were prepared for me, and once every ten days an abundance of all kinds of wine. Yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions, because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. So in one of these verses here in the middle, it says, but I did not do so, he did not sin in that manner, because of the fear of God. So the fear of God can keep us from sin. And like you said, it's not a negative fear, Barbara, it's a, it's a respectful type of fear. I like the example of Nehemiah shows, I do see that a good leader gives up their rights. If you've got a leader who is just taking control, taking power, pushing people around, being selfish with it, that's obviously a poor leader. But a good leader, um, like we see in the case of Jesus, the best one we've ever seen, he gives up his rights for the people, just like Nehemiah did. And no one has ever given up so many rights as Jesus Christ did for us. No one. Page 140 on the margin, it says God pleasing. Nehemiah's goal in life was not to make a personal profit but to please God, he did not ask, will this help me? Instead, he asked, will this make God happy? When faced with financial decisions or any other decision, make sure you ask the right questions. And we need to learn to, um, somebody was teaching recently about um, don't just take something of your own and then ask the Lord to bless it. Um, just go back from that point and say, the Lord, what what do you want for me? What do you want me to take? What do you want me to work on and to do? And then he will certainly bless it because you're within his will doing what he wants you to do. So it's not, 
even ministries, you know, let's, let's do this and let's grow this and let's just, you know, have lots of numbers and uh, very fruitful and people give all kinds of money and, um, well, maybe are you sure that the Lord wants this particular thing to grow? Maybe in his punishment and sovereignty or he needs a fresh start somewhere. Um, he doesn't want that, at least for a season. So we have to pray about it and then ask what his will is. And then that's what we need to do, not, not the plan we come up with on our own. And then point nine on page 141 says, Pleasing God is never to be a burden, but a privilege and a gift. We are able to please God only because he enables us to do so, because of our good work, because our good works come from him. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Psalms 90, 17. And it really is a joy to do his work. Um, we just never know what the day is going to bring. And this morning when Lori called asking me to fill in, it's like, oh no, but I'm not, I'm not dressed right and I'm not prepared. <laughs> Normally I way overthink and overanalyze everything, every scripture, everything I might try to say. Let's just, let's come up with something. And, um. I thought, this is a blessing, you know, because it's teaching me that it's okay not to overanalyze everything, and it's okay to um, to be humbled by today, and it's certainly wonderful to have the blessing of being able to serve in some small way that when you woke up, you didn't think you were going to have the opportunity, and I just became really grateful and really excited. So, thank you guys very much. So let's, let's just all stay prayerful and watchful of the Lord's will and what he has for us, both on a daily basis and then over time on a larger scale. What, what does the Lord want for us? What is he doing for us? And let's act on that. Kayla, I'm sure I'll speak for everyone here that we are thankful that you agreed to take that challenge that morning. <laughs> I told Barbara, as long as you guys have a lot of comments, you know, I'll stand up here. But it was a, it was a very good group discussion. So, thank you. Um, next week, um, I will be leading a class for the next two weeks. And uh, it's on uh, Chapter 6 and um, Lesson 6. And it's overcoming oppositions with that word of integrity that we just discussed a little bit about. So do less days one and two, if you would please be prepared to help with that. <clears throat> um, let's see. Um, Kathleen. Kathleen. Yes, ma'am. Could you look and read over the um, the prayer list, please? What do you have? Is I found out slightly different from the one I had, so I'll give you yours. Uh, Betty Bradley died. Uh, Katie was a friend of Kathy Turner. 